Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the THO Movie Reviews Podcast, the show where we bring you passionate, honest, and insightful film criticism. I'm your host, Bennett Campbell Ferguson, and I am here today to do an audio commentary on Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi. I'm so delighted that you've decided to join me. Um, it's going to be a rollicking, rollicking time, as anyone who's followed the debate surrounding The Last Jedi knows. You can't talk about this film without things getting intense, and uh, there is a lot to wrestle with. So, without further ado, let's get started. I am on the menu right now, and uh, so we can all sync up and you can watch the movie with me. I am going to hit play in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, play. So, we have covered The Last Jedi extensively here at THO Movie Reviews. We did two reviews, in fact, and uh, both of them showed that uh, at THO we are a microcosm of the greater response to this film. The response was very divided, and it wasn't just a matter of, you know, audiences versus critics or fans versus non-fans or something like that. The division was uh, across the board. Critics were divided, audiences were divided, fans were divided. Um, And it was like that at THO. Uh, Some of us liked the film very, very much. Uh, My wonderful colleague Patrick Bellin uh, even named it his favorite film of 2017. Uh, Others, including myself, uh, were not as psyched about it. And... uh, it it it's an interesting thing and it was really i was a little bit surprised at the divisiveness and uh i was also dismayed at how toxic the commentary quickly became and uh worst of all how racism and misogyny became a big big part of the commentary with people attacking the film you know uh throwing racist slurs at the character of uh, Rose, played by Kelly Marie Tran, you know, uh, doing such horrible sexist things as uh, creating a version of the film with all the women edited out. And uh, the discussion surrounding the film, uh, surprisingly, for, you know, a movie that, when not judging by Star Wars terms, but judging by movies terms, is not really that bold when you think about it, uh, the discussion became uh, very intense and very polarized and very painful and uh, uh, certainly uh, hurtful to many people. And part of the reason I wanted to do this commentary is that, in a sense, I feel that I am in the middle. While I do feel that in a lot of ways the film does not work, I also feel that it has a lot of wonderful qualities and a lot of interesting storytelling choices And I do understand the appeal. I I feel that I do understand why this film has impacted people. And uh, just as there are things about there that I despise, there are things about it that I love. So I wanted to take a moment to wade into this debate and uh, thoughtfully, cohesively, and uh, just just overall, you know... uh, with a lot of love and care, just discuss the film and uh, try and bring a little more clarity to the discussion. Obviously, that's not something that can be accomplished in one commentary. It probably can't even be accomplished in uh, in a lifetime, if, you know, as the prequels have shown. And even the original trilogy, debates about Star Wars uh, tend to rage for generations because this is a, a timeless and elemental mythology that speaks to people and... Uh, draws a lot of, you know, strong feelings out. But I want to try to add my uh, two cents and do this right. So one of the most controversial things about this film is the humor. Um, And I want to talk about the different sort of classifications of humor. There is... uh, there's one kind of humor that we see in Star Wars, which is just uh, comedic bits or jokes. For example, um, uh, you know, when Leia says, will somebody get this walking carpet out of my way? 
it's part of a sort of naturally comedic exchange between her and Han, because uh, they're always at each other's throats, and, you know, with a little edge of sexual tension, and by nature that dy dynamic is going to be very naturally funny. And the other kind of humor is uh, humor where we see a dramatic scene, and then humor is inserted to uh, take the tension and sort of uh, mock the drama, take the air out of it a bit, you know, uh, take it down a peg, essentially. And that's what this film uh, has a lot of. You know, you see this scene here with uh, Poe Dameron uh, faking out General Hux, and the interesting thing is that it's a big dramatic scene. The resistance is fleeing. The First Order is descending. The stakes are high. And then uh, we get a little Yo Mama joke that kind of intrudes and kind of takes it down a peg. And uh, I actually like this scene because uh, it plays on things we've seen before, but, you know, takes a new twist. You know, I'm sure a lot of people have wondered, you know, in the midst of these firefights, well, why don't you try talking? Why don't you try a little psychological warfare? We've never really seen that before in Star Wars. So it twists things. It evolves things. You know, it, uh, it, it, it tweaks the established formulas a bit to have that happen. But generally, the tension diffusing humor in this film, I do not think it works uh, that well. I prefer humor where, uh, you know, things are played... Uh, how should I put this? I prefer... I prefer blockbusters that don't constantly have their tongue in your their cheek. And I don't think... I think you can be uh you can be funny and you can be entertaining without having you know your tongue in your cheek you know you look at um uh, the first pirates of the caribbean film uh which while well, the sequels were just an abomination that first film i think is still absolutely wonderful and a joy to watch and in that film you know uh the comedy isn't to use to diffuse tension or create sort of a a spoof vibe where, you know, they take serious things and they mock them, you know. Again, comedy, comedy arises very naturally because Jack Sparrow is an eccentric character. And it's uh, it's sort of the opposite of The Last Jedi. And this is the kind of humor in The Last Jedi that we see more from uh, the Avengers and Guardians of the Galaxy and even Deadpool to a certain extent. And uh, I think partly brought on by the... Uh, the style of humor that Marvel Studios has done in their films, I think, you know, that has been very influential and has uh, come into other films as well. And I think in a lot of mainstream films, there's a, there's a fear of uh, being too serious or being too sincere, because the more sincere and the more serious you are, the greater potential there is uh, for for you to be laughed at, for you to be mocked. You know, one thing I always notice is that, you know, Avatar and Titanic, those were two films that, you know, were insanely popular upon their release and still endure to this day, you know, Titanic particularly. And by the way, I think uh, Titanic is absolutely one of my top ten favorite films of all time. I believe it is a masterpiece of cinematic storytelling of the highest order. But, you know, you know, once when people were in the moment, you know, kind of being affected by those films and being, you know, keyed into the emotions, they, uh, I, I don't feel that, I mean, honestly, I, I should backtrack. I did not follow, you know, the, uh, so sort of the conversation around Titanic when it was released when I was very young, uh, because, you know, I, I was a kid that time. I was born in 91, the film came out in 97, uh, but it seemed later there was almost like a a fear of taking the film seriously, and that it was, you know, suddenly it became hip to laugh at the sentimentality. Same thing with Avatar. But while sent sentimentality is easy to mock, I think sentimentality can be a beautiful thing. You know, what is Star Wars without Luke Skywalker staring at the twin sun setting, you know? What is Star Wars, you know, uh, without Han and Leia falling in love and you feeling that emotion without irony, without apology, you know, just on a very pure, earnest level. 
you know, I believe that uh, sincerity is one of the greatest weapons that you can have in cinema. And uh, I think The Force Awakens was a little more committed to that. Because J.J. Abrams, he is a very sincere, sentimental guy. You know, this is the man who began that first uh, Star Trek film that he did with a uh, a child being born as his father is sacrificing himself. It doesn't get more sincere and sentimental than that, you know. J.J. Abrams is very fearless about, you know, pure, clean, hard-on-your-sleeve emotions. Ryan Johnson is uh, a little zanier, and uh, we'll get into that more here. By the way, this scene, I believe, is an homage to Abrams' first Star Trek, because, again, we open the film with a space battle where a hero sacrifices themselves. It's, uh, it's very tricky, though. You know, you look at that scene back in that first Star Trek, and Abrams uh, very quickly establishes character dynamics. You know, we f see, as I mentioned, that uh, George Kirk, uh, Captain Kirk's father, has a wife, has a child that's about to be born. So there's dramatic context. This uh, scene uh, has a, essentially, Paige, a random rebel pilot, sacrificing herself. And uh, it has to very quickly uh, engage us with her plight. And uh, essentially to set up Rose, her sister, later. And to give Rose's character arc more meaning. And uh, that's fine. You know, as uh, you know, films like Dunkirk have shown, we can care very deeply in a movie about characters whom we know very little about. But all the same, I do feel that this whole bit here feels forced and uh y you know you have this moment where i'm uh uh page grabs hold of the half m or quarter moon shaped piece of metal the hazy and smelt as it is apparently called and uh so that we'll see that and know that you know rose who also has one of those as her sister later and get the idea that there is a connection but, you know, I don't know. I have uh, kind of become annoyed with sort of the use of symbolic objects in films. Sometimes they can be very effective. You know, you look at the X-Men film, where we have a totem in uh, Wolverine's uh, dog tags, which are kind of used to symbolize his past, symbolize his unfinished business. And when he takes off the dog tags, you know, he is free of the past. But um, a lot of movies use these things, uh, these kind of symbolic items, a lot more lazily. And the hazy and smell, I believe, is sort of an example of that. It's really only there to show the connection w between Rose and Paige. And, uh, you know, there's an even lazier example in uh, Solo, a Star Wars story which is in theaters now, uh, which we also review. Please check out our review of that if you if you so desire. Um, uh, that uses Han's dice, which also figure into the Last Jedi in a big way. Uh, Han gives them to Kira, his love interest played by Amelia Clark, and then she gives them back. And you know, with the dice constantly exchanging hands, it, it kind of feels like it's meant to be meaningful. You know, we're seeing uber close up images of the dice, but you know, it just. Uh, it feels like it's straining, and it feels like they never symbolize as much as, uh, you know, Ron Howard, who directed the film, wanted them to. It feels more like, here's an object. It's important, you know? And then it never really seems to symbolize that much. By the way, there's uh, Noah Sagan, who has uh, uh, first appeared way back in Ryan Johnson's first film, Brick, which is a wonderful, wonderful film. I never liked this whole thing about Finn leaking bag, you know, this sight gag, because I feel like, you know, why does it have to be a funny thing when he comes out of there, you know? Why can't they just sort of play it dramatically? But I don't have to, you know, kind of like with Luke in the back of the Tank and the Empire, 
But I don't, I don't have time to get into that because I gotta talk about this. The lightsaber. One of the most tiresome things about any discussion about The Last Jedi is that there always has to be like five hours devoted to this whole bit with the dang lightsaber being thrown over Luke's shoulder. But I have to talk about it because there actually is a great deal to say. First of all, I know some people feel that this isn't meant to be comedic, but I remember people laughing in the theater, and kind of the way they build it up with the music, the music rising, look, this is going to be dramatic, look, this is going to be dramatic, it pumps us up to, you know, for a big moment. And they just very casually flips the lightsaber over his shoulder. Flip! And, you know, kind of that is, again, a sort of an idea of tension-diffusing humor, and it seems like it's there to be clever, to be like, ha-ha, you thought it was a big moment? It's not! He doesn't even want the lightsaber! And it just... I find that kind of humor kind of annoying, because, again, it's the difference between humor and humor that is specifically inserted to diffuse tension, and I feel that that feels a bit awkward. But that's not what you want to hear about. You want to hear about uh, all the many... Uh, uh, ideological debates about the lightsaber being thrown over the shoulder. Or maybe you don't want to hear, hear about it. Maybe you're sick of it like I am. But we got to talk about it nonetheless. So I think there's a little bit of resistance to that moment because fans don't like seeing Luke, say, Luke Skywalker throw his lightsaber away, you know? Luke is a character who means so much to those of us who love Star Wars. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about why later. Uh... And the idea is that, you know, to see him throw the lightsaber away is, is hurtful and painful to people. But, you know, I don't think that's the real issue. Because Spider-Man is also a very meaningful character. And, you know, I don't think any of us had a, had a problem with, you know, him throwing his costume in the garbage in Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Because that was a very interesting character development. And it was well played. No, you see, I think the real problem with Luke Skywalker throwing away the lightsaber is something much, much deeper. You see, if you were going to bring Luke back, it could not just be a cameo. You know, that would not feel worthy of a character who is such a towering figure in pop culture, who is such a great, iconic hero who's been on an incredible journey throughout the series. If he was going to be here, he had to have a character arc. To have a character arc, you had to set him up for it. And really, the only logical way to set him up for it was to have him, you know, essentially not be Luke anymore. To have him have fallen from grace. To have him... So he would have somewhere to grow emotionally. That's why he throws the lightsaber away. To set up that arc so he can emerge triumphant at the, be the end and we can cheer. Now, the problem with that, the big, big, big problem with that is that, you know, it feels soap operatic. We've seen Luke go through ups and downs over the course of three movies. We've seen him evolve from, you know, a kid, uh, a miserable and isolated on a desert planet, to a troubled young warrior, to a wiser, older hero who cares as much about peace as he does about war. To unmake him, to say, oh, psych, he's uh, given up the Jedi Order again, you know, or, or not again, but, you know, has essentially again fallen from grace, that just feels uh, tiresome. You know, it feels like on a TV show when they create some new dramatic complication so they can, you know, give the character something to do. It feels wearying. It feels mechanical. And uh, it feels depressing, you know? There was something very beautiful about the idea that, you know, Luke survived this great conflict and got to live happily ever after. And I know that doesn't isn't how it is in real life, and, you know, we need to understand, you know, that, you know, sometimes things work out. But the thing about Star Wars is that, you know, it was always not just honest about the complications of growing up and, you know, the way that we all fluctuate between good and evil impulses. Star Wars was also aspirational. It showed us how things could be. It showed us how good could be found 
even in someone as evil as Darth Vader, and to take away the aspirational element and show that, you know, oh, just like everyone, you know, Luke grows up to be old and miserable. I find that depressing. I find that tiresome. Because just as we need honest mythologies that are dramatic and, you know, are, you know, open about the challenges that all of us face as we age, I think we also need stories that give us hope. And to have that hope taken away is very, very depressing. I want to talk about some scene transitions here. You notice that um, when Finn emerges from his uh, healing back to suit, uh, his first question to Poe is, where's Ray?" And then in the very next scene, uh, we see Ray, And then, uh, then that scene ends with Luke saying, where's Han? And we cut to Kylo Ren, who of course murdered Han, and uh, then that scene ends with, uh, you know, Kylo Ren, and then we cut to Rey saying, there's no life left, light, light left in Kylo Ren, excuse me. And uh, there's something very elegant about these scene transitions. You know, Ryan Johnson, uh, as I said, I am a very, very big fan of his first film, Brick, which was a uh, high school, uh, contemporary high school riff on... Uh, film noir, uh, the older noirs that starred, you know, actors like Humphrey Bogart. And uh, he co-opted the lingo of those films very, very craftily and very elegantly. And uh, while he has certainly made some mistakes, he can be a very sharp writer. And those scene tra transitions uh, show that there is a real artistry to what he does. Unfortunately, there is no artistry to this very, very unfortunate scene where he grabs this poor creature's breast and squeezes it. Not sure how that's allowed to be PG-13, kids. I want to talk about this bit here where Luke goes fishing. Um, uh, back in the New Yorker's review of uh, Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, one thing they criticize is that they found the Star Wars uh, universe to be sort of sanitized, and they cited the fact that people don't seem to eat in this world. Well, that's not quite true. We, uh, we do see food, but uh, not a lot of it. You know, we don't really, we hardly ever see characters sitting down to a meal. It did happen in Attack of the Clones, but... I think a lot of people would uh, just as soon forget Attack of the Clones, although I have to admit I have a soft spot for a number of scenes in that film. Give me a break. I was a, I was like a ten-year-old when it came out. It made an impression on me. But um, uh, the food. I like the idea that Star Wars was never specific about food. If we saw uh, you know, a piece of food, like that little you know, nubbin Yoda eats in The Empire Strikes Back or the soup in his hut, we were never sure quite exactly what it is. It was always kind of vague. And that helped with a certain, uh, you know, cultural non-specificity of Star Wars. It was vague, you know, it was broad. It felt almost that it could take place anywhere, you know, in, in any universe. You know, Star Wars is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It's not our universe. It's not an extension of our universe like Star Trek. It's sort of a, you know, a self-contained mirror for our world. And uh, as silly as this may sound, I really believe this. The food, I think, and the genericness of the food was key to making it universal as possible. Now, I know that, you know, a franchise that un until recent years has been pretty much all about, you know, white guys and their white guy issues, you know, how nonspecific can it be? That's a fair point. Uh, but I think the breadth was important. 
And also, you know, I don't think you ever saw anyone eating meat in Star Wars. So if there were any, so for, you know, vegan or vegetarian kids out there, you know, they could, you know, not necessarily feel like, you know, oh, you know, everyone in pop culture is a meat eater. You know, everyone, you know, everyone does that, you know, and I'm, you know, a freak. But here we see Luke cash, catching a fish and uh, catching it in kind of a gross way with a spear. And uh, I don't know. I feel that that's too specific. I feel that that kind of hinders the breadth of the saga. And by the way, in case you were wondering, yes, I am a vegetarian. So I do have a stake in this fight. No pun intended. But again, these films did broaden, you know, Star Wars in other, you know, arguably more meaningful ways, you know. The diversity of the cast obviously comes to mind. You know, um, uh, Mr. Plinkett, I hope you're all familiar with Mr. Plinkett, the uh, wonderful, wonderfully cranky YouTube persona created by uh, Mike Stoklasa, the great film critic. Uh, those Mr. Plinkett videos he's done, you know, in one of them he talked about the diversity of the cast, and uh, uh, he said some cynical things about it, but he also pointed out that, you know, you see that, you know, on both sides, in the resistance, the good guys, and in the First Order, the bad guys. And uh, you could argue that that is a, a very positive thing, you know. Every, uh, everyone, in, you know, wherever, regardless of their background in these newer films, is allowed to be as good or bad as they want. Now, there's also the argument that, uh, you know, diversifying the villains uh, takes away the vibe of the uh, original films, where on the side of the Empire, we only saw pretty much middle-aged to old white men running the show, and the Rebel Alliance was more diverse. The idea being that, you know, the Empire was this misogynistic, racist, uh, exclusionary force. And, uh, I think that's an argument worth considering as well. Always good to see Admiral Ackbar again. <laughs> There were some complaints among people that uh, it wasn't very exciting or dynamic to have a plot be that the resistance is running out of fuel. But think about the best action films or, you know, the best big blockbusters to come out of the past few years. They're all films in uh, which there is a ticking clock. Films where, uh, you know time or resources or energy is something uh, or something is running out 
and the heroes have to soldier on and uh, get the job done before, uh, while they still can. You know, you look at Dunkirk, you know, they have to get off the beach before uh, the German forces arrive. Uh, you look at Gravity, you know, uh, Sandra Bullock's character has a limited amount of time to uh, get back down to Earth, or she's going to be obliterated by debris, you know. You look at Mad Max Fury Road, you know, they have to outrun uh, Morton Joe's thugs and uh, get to the green place by a certain time. Or not by a certain time, but, you know, there's a constant threat that they're fighting against. The clock is ticking. Same thing, of course, in Inception. And I think having the resistance run out of fuel, uh, having them, you know, deal with, you know, something very measurable, very concrete that they are going to lose and need more of, I think that was an incredibly uh, savvy storytelling move. And uh, again, while there is certainly messy writing in this film, that was a very, very sharp decision. Now this scene uh, where we see uh, Leia and Kylo Ren, mother and son, making this mental connection. Note the editing of the scene, the way, uh, the sort of, I feel like a bad film student. I promise you, I did get a film degree, but I can't remember the term offhand. The, the sort of dissolve or crossfade between their faces. Uh, it's exactly what we saw between uh, Luke and Darth Vader when they made a telepathic connection at the end of The Empire Strikes Back. And I love it when, you know, obviously I want to see Star Wars pushed in new visual directions, but I love when continuity is maintained through, you know, certain stylistic devices, you know, through um, uh, these little, you know, visual tricks that, you know, are instantly familiar from other Star Wars films. I think that that is something that is really, really, really very quite cool. You know, it's the same thing with, uh, you know, the wipes. A lot of people feel they're very cheesy. I remember my digital video production professor at PSU, Dustin Morrow, kind of jokingly reviews, referred to them as the star wipe. And he says, you know, don't do those unless you are George Lucas. And the reason he said that is because, you know, George Lucas said, uh, you know, he did it so much that it became a part of his identity as a storyteller. You know, uh, as a rule, you're not really supposed to do stuff like that in films because it looks absolutely ridiculous and overdone. Uh, but, you know, it became a part of the language. You know, it was a part of the Star Wars vocabulary and it came to feel very natural. And I love that, you know, these films continue that. Uh the Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, although they could have taken some other visual chances. This scene with um, uh, Leia, the so-called Mary Poppins scene, it's funny how, you know, there are a lot of moments that people fixate on The Last Jedi that they don't like. Um, by this scene, the lightsaber bit over the shoulder, uh, Rey um, uh, turning out to be essentially no one, you know, these moments people key into. I think the thing that I have no problem with Leia using the Force to survive the vacuum of space, what I do have a problem with is, um, uh, for one thing, the effect looks a little cheesy, and for another thing, we see Leia using the Force, but uh, we never see her become a Jedi. And uh, one of the greatest lines, I thought, in Return of the Jedi was when Luke says to Leia, you know, you have that power too. In time, you'll learn to use it as I have. And the idea that she was going to not only be a rebellion leader, but also, you know, grow into a Jedi Knight, into a warrior, and, you know, discover the full extent of her power, I thought there was something very beautiful and empowering, the idea that that character was going to grow. But, oh, by the way, you know, this stupid bit with Chewie and the Porgs, that I, I hate it. It just, it's just, it's so overly cutesy. Um, uh, but back to Leia. You know, I liked the idea that she was going to evolve. And uh, I, I feel like by kind of, you know, not having her evolve, 
by having her simply go back to being, you know, a rebellion leader, as it were, it almost feels like it's it's trying to ignore the events of Return of the Jedi and sort of set the status quo back to the way things were in the original Star Wars film from 77. And uh, I get it, they're trying to make it, you know, accessible to people who don't necessarily remember every detail of the original trilogy, but at the same time, it feels lazy, and it feels unimaginative. And uh, I think for, you know, a series that, you know, has really tried to expand the cast in terms of including more women, I think it's a shame that they really never allowed, you know, the uh, central female character in the, the original trilogy to grow as uh, she might have grown. I can certainly be very cynical about these films, and I really feel that, honestly, Star Wars should have ended with Return of the Jedi, and that the original trilogy should have been allowed to remain one complete work, and that there was no need to tack on more stuff and essentially have these reunion movies, as it were, but I gotta admit, it still uh, gets me seeing Luke and R2-D2 together. There's something beautiful about that. Now, while Ryan Johnson is, um, uh, actually, I'm not going to go into that. That's not really a point worth taking up. Now, here's a scene I have a bit of trouble with. Um... Laura Dern's character takes the helm of the Resistance fleet in this scene. Her character, Vice Admiral Emelyn Holdo. And um, there's a line she has. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the line is. It'll come up in just a sec. was that line? Oh. Why am I having trouble remembering it? Well, this whole monologue, uh, the downtrodden and the oppressed Nora symbol, you know, we are the fire, we will light the fire that will restore the Republic. It feels a bit on the nose, you know. One thing, you know, again, as I was saying, I love sentimentality in movies. But I feel that, you know, it can be overplayed, you know. And I'm sure those of you who um, uh, are, um, uh, are, you know, remember, as I mentioned earlier, that I love Titanic, are about to laugh at me and say, Titanic overplayed it. You know, well, you know, what can I say? Certain things work in certain contexts and not others. But, you know, this overt sentimentality, I feel, does not work for Star Wars. You know, you remember in Return of the Jedi when uh, Ma Mothma, the leader of the Rebel Alliance, when she uh, pumps everyone up for the Battle of Endor, there's no big philosophy in her speech. She just tells them what they need to do to get the, to the job done, you know? You have to go on this mission, you have to destroy the Death Star and kill the Emperor. She doesn't say, you know, we are the spark that will light the fire, that will, you know restore hope or any of that, you know? It's just very simple. And, you know, the thing is, Star Wars is thematically and emotionally complex and gets into a lot of moral ambiguity, but the storytelling is very clean and very simple, much like in a fairy tale, in a Grimm's fairy tale. And I feel to sort of have these overt, you know, uh, you know, bits of inspirational hook'em, you know, spelled out in lines, I feel is a bit on the nose. And, you know, certainly Star Wars has dealt with, um, uh, you know, putting ideas in specific lines of dialogue before, but like, you know, when Yoda did it, it was, uh, there was always an edge to his wisdom, you know, uh, a quirkiness, you know, it wasn't maudlin Hallmark movie stuff. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter, you know, it was more poetic than that.
So we now find uh, Finn meeting Rose. Again, I want to say um, it's incredibly disturbing to me the uh, amount of racism I've seen on the part of Star Wars fans. It's not surprising, uh, considering that you know bigotry has always thrived on this planet and continues to thrive under the uh, administration of Donald Trump, who has tried to normalize a lot of these despicable attitudes. But even if racism, you know, is expected, it's uh, it's still always disheartening, and uh, I think it's really shameful the way people have behaved. I was talking with a friend the other day, and we were talking about the uh, racism and the misogyny uh, directed at the new show Star Trek Discovery. And we were talking about the idea of how people don't understand, some people don't understand that, you know, inclusiveness was, uh, you know, all a part of Gene Roddenberry's vision. Star Wars is not as progressive as Star Trek, but on the other hand, uh, Star Wars has always been a progressive saga, you know. George Lucas, uh, politically was a very progressive character and remains so. And, uh, he took care, especially in Return of the Jedi, to, uh, show that, you know, the Rebel Alliance was made up of many different races and all, even many different species, while, uh, the Empire's Empire was this fascist force of all these people who looked the same, you know, using technology to uh, oppress everyone they considered to be inferior. And uh, this stuff is built into the DNA of Star Wars. So go ahead, you know, <laughs> you know, sling, you know, racist nonsense at these movies, but understand this has always been what Star Wars is. Star Wars is progressive. Star Wars, uh, you know, was even starting to become more inclusive back in Return of the Jedi. And, uh, you know, I have my qualms about the way the regime at Lucasfilm has, you know, handled these new films and, you know, the way they've handled the ideas and the motifs of the saga. But, you know, in, in terms of trying to build a diverse cast, a, a cast that looks more like the actual world we live in, they were vibing off of something that was uh, in the original films. It's just that they were taking it further. They were trying to uh, expand even more. And that means something. And that's the reality, whether people like it or not. Now, I was complaining about um, uh, the sometimes lazy use of uh, symbolic objects earlier. One symbolic object that is used very well is this uh, uh, cloaked binary beacon that they have so Ray can locate them. I love the idea that Finn takes the beacon because he's going to leave so Ray can come find him somewhere else and won't get caught up in the war. And in that moment, the beacon comes to symbolize that, uh, you know, his secret that he wants to escape. And then uh, in this moment coming up where he hands the beacon to Poe, it comes to symbolize, I am putting my faith in you. I'm trusting you to win this day so my friend will not die. And so there is an evolving emotional significance and symbolism to the object most symbolic objects in movies seem to mean one thing. This is an object that means many different things. And there's something, uh, there's something rather beautiful about that.
a poet with a blaster is how Maz uh, describes Benito the the well no she's actually she's talking about Justin Theroux's character I forgot um uh, I love that line of poet with a blaster I also love it um uh, when she says you know that when C three PO says this code breaker can do everything and uh, Maz says oh yes he can. Whether people want to admit, admit it or not, sex is a very big part of Star Wars. We've yet to have an actual sex scene in Star Wars, and uh, given the precedent uh, set by the original films, it's likely that we never will. But sex always you know, lurked in these films, and uh, we'll get to that later, because it plays a big role here. It's kind of one of those things. You don't see it. But it's always there. And it's always on the minds of the characters. Sex with the lack of it. Uh, for all my many, many quarrels with Ryan Johnson, I have to applaud his uh, idea for this telepathic connection between Ray and Kylo Ren, which is beautifully executed by the sound design, how, uh, you know, the background noise grows more muted when they connect, uh, signifying that they've sort of entered a world, a world that they share. Um, but also, the best stories of heroes and villains are the stories where the hero and villain don't just fight each other. They actually have a relationship. And by relationship, I mean... They actually have conversations. They speak to each other. They, uh, you know, talk to each other human being to human being. It's something that can complicate, you know, a hero-villain dynamic and uh, make it more human, more subtle. And uh, it just, uh, it means there's more at stake. And Star Wars, again, this is something that there's a precedent for in Star Wars, you know, uh, Luke and Darth Vader had uh, a real relationship in Return of the Jedi. That scene in uh, the film where Luke surrenders and just has a little conversation with Vader before the window in on Endor, that's one of the greatest moments in all of Star Wars because, you know, the hero and villain are just talking. Same thing with the scenes between Luke and the Empire. Or, or Luke, I mean Luke and the Emperor in Return of the Jedi. It's a very beautiful thing because it's a war of words, you know, and, and Star Wars has always understood the, uh, the importance of words. While certainly these films are a masterclass, at least the original films, in how to stage action in a coherent, exciting, and beautiful way, uh, they've also understood the importance of conversations and, you know, what conversations can reveal about, reveal about what a person is thinking, what a person is feeling. And certainly the conversations between Ray and Kylo Ren do that, although there's uh, an issue with all that that I will get to later. But for now, we have to talk about Ray's training. For the record, I don't like this bit coming up where um, uh, Luke slaps Ray's hand with the leaf. For me... That's just not Luke. Luke has always um, uh, been a more serious cat. He hasn't been the kind of guy who would trick someone and uh, take pleasure in humiliating them. And while people certainly change with age, that's one thing that I just cannot believe would change. I feel that, uh, you know, again, this is something... Uh, they talked about on the, the Mr. Plinkett channel on Red Letter Media. I feel that it doesn't work for you know Luke to have these one-liners. I just don't feel that that's who Luke is. I feel like he's kind of a straight arrow. But there are some things I do like about uh, this scene where he trains Ray. I do like the montage we see of uh, nature all over the island. And it is a montage, it's little fragments, you know, of sunlight, of water, of plants. It reminds me of, um, 
something from a Terrence Malick movie. And uh, those of you who uh, follow THO know that Terrence Malick is a director who I love with all my heart and soul. And, uh, you know, I love the idea of, uh, you know, bringing an almost experimental, slightly surreal, you know, Malick-style, weird nature photography vibe to Star Wars. It's strange, but it's, uh, it's rather beautiful. And uh, if you remember what Obi-Wan said about the Force in the very first film, and I'll try to do my best Alec Guinness impersonation, the Force is a power that penetrates and binds the galaxy together. I probably didn't get that quite right, but um, uh, forgive me. You know, uh, this montage is really just a new way of visualizing that retrenching the idea of the Force uh, for people who may need a refresher course, which is something the prequels never did, by the way. They never really, you know, uh, re-explain what the Force is, aside from the whole convoluted, overlytical midichlorian bit. And yes, I am still mad about that. One thing that I don't think works about the scene is when Luke says, uh, balance, powerful light, powerful darkness. I never got the sense that, um, uh, I mean, the whole idea of balance to the Force, that came with the prequels, and, you know, to be honest, the prequels are so wretched that I don't necessarily even consider them canon, personally, uh, but I don't like the idea that there has to be power or balance between the light side and the dark side. I always saw the idea that there was the force and there was the dark side. And you want uh, the good side of the force to be stronger. And the dark side is, you know, this kind of unnatural growth that you want to resist. Beautiful cut right there from, you know, the uh, water bursting up from underneath the ground to racing and her suddenly falling on her hands. It's a very rapid and surreal cut that, you know, kind of uh, skips over some stuff and, you know, leaves some holes and is, feels disjointed, but in a good way. You know, Ray is discombobulated by this encounter, and uh, it makes sense that we should be too. So we have the scene here with Rey outside the Millennium Falcon. And I love that little detail with uh, her feeling the water as it drips off the spaceship. You know, there's something very, very beautiful about that. Because, you know, it's just, it's a very simple human moment. It doesn't move the plot forward. Uh, it doesn't have any relevance to the greater story. It, um... Uh, it's just a moment with a young girl kind of being awestruck by nature and wanting to feel, you know, that water on her hand. And Star Wars, you know, Star Wars is, you know, something that has to be very tightly plotted. But I think it's worthwhile to let it wander a bit, you know, let these kind of off-the-cuff human moments emerge. It makes the characters richer, it gives them greater personality. I like that very much. What I don't like is this moment where Ray says uh, to Kylo Ren, you're a monster, and he says, yes, I am. That's lazy writing. It's very misguided. B.
because no villain, however monstrous they may be, is going to see themselves as a monster. That's just not the way it works. We all have to tell ourselves we're good in order to get up in the morning. I don't know what exactly Ryan Johnson was thinking. Maybe he thinks that Kylo Ren was trying to intimidate Rey. Um, uh, maybe he thinks that Kylo Ren feels guilty, but I never quite felt that. Well, we're now on Canto Bite, yet another one of those things that seems to be the subject of never-ending and exhausting debate. I don't know that I have a problem with Canto Bite per se. I do, however, have a problem with its place in the story. You know, a lot of this film hinges on, you know, Finn's evolution. He starts out as a soldier in the First Order. The first film was about how he broke away. This film has to be about how he, you know commits to the resistance, how he uh, not only fights with them, but believes in it. I don't think Canto Bite was um, uh, the right way to facilitate that. Uh, a wonderful YouTube video from Lessons from the Screenplay made an absolutely brilliant point that Finn's transformation into, you know, a true believer is uh, affected by him, you know, listening to two monologues, essentially. Rose lectures him about the animals being mistreated and the, you know, the weapons manufacturing on the planet. And then, uh, De and so he, he chooses to, uh, is he's inspired by that to, uh, you know, take a broader view of things, care about the greater good. And then later, DJ gives him a speech where he says, you know, it's all a machine, you know, partner. Live freed, don't join. And uh, the, issue, and the issue with that is, you know, he's being told things and he's reacting to them. He's not actively growing. He's not actively learning. And I, I don't think, you know, just seeing a couple animals mistreated, you know, listening to some speeches basically that's not how you um uh, you weave a great character transformation you weave a great character transformation by showing how characters evolve in certain situations how they act and how they react the choices they make when they are pushed you know a great example of this is the very first spider-man film peter parker um uh, wants to get the girl so he chooses to fight in the ring for money. He doesn't get paid the money, so he acts vengefully and lets a criminal who's robbing the place escape. That criminal later kills Uncle Ben, and uh, Peter feels guilty and realizes his selfishness. His journey is motivated through his actions and the situations his actions place him in. Uncle Ben says, with great power comes great responsibility, but it's through Peter's own journey, his personal journey, that he comes to feel those words. Whereas Finn's journey feels like just words. This bit of ray training here is really quite beautifully done. I love how the lighting is so clear and clean and crisp. Another uh, idea that Lessons from the Screenplay talked about is the idea that um, for a film to be compelling, a character needs some flaw they have to overcome. Now, there's this continuing thing where people criticize the character of Rey for being a Mary Sue, uh, meaning that she has... She's too clever, she's too perfect, she doesn't make enough mistakes. I happen to believe that uh, these comments are fueled by misogyny. However, 
I do believe that these films, to a certain degree, put Ray up on a pedestal. You don't see that many flaws, and you never really see that much training, so you don't see that much growth. So there is a sense that there's a fear of, you know, unlike Luke, who we see very clearly flirting with the dark side, we don't really get that from Ray, and there's almost a fear, there, these films sort of tread lightly around her. They're afraid to really test her, to really push her to her limits, and to, you know, really get to the core of, you know, whatever imperfections she, like any human being, might have. And I do think that's a problem. There's less of an opportunity for growth than there was with Luke in the original trilogy. Now, basically, you know, Ray is the one in this film telling Luke, you need to get out there. You need to, you know, become the leader of the Jedi again and inspire us all. And in the end, Ray turns out to be right. Luke comes to believe the truth of her words. So, that's a bit problematic. That's a bit problematic because, you know, your main character doesn't have, you know, much space to grow. She starts out with uh, one belief and the film confirms that she's right. Although I will say that uh, in a certain way she's wrong about Kylo Ren and that's a more interesting element of the story. And we will get into that later. Ray mentions in this scene that um, uh, the fact that Darth Vader turned to the good side at the end. And, uh, you know, that wasn't mentioned at all in The Force Awakens to the point where I almost felt like they were just sort of ignoring that fact. You know, especially with Kylo Ren, you know, worshipping Darth Vader and saying, I'll finish what you started, even though what Darth Vader did in the end was renounce evil and kill the Emperor. Now, I can't stress enough, Darth Vader's redemption is the one, is perhaps the most important part of Star Wars. Star Wars started out as a story of good versus evil, Empire versus Rebels. But the meat of the story was that it evolved into something more. It evolved from a story of good versus evil to a story of how good and evil are far more intertwined than many people would like to admit. And that while certainly there are things in this universe that are absolutely right and absolutely wrong, sometimes the best person can have a seed of darkness in them, like Luke did. Sometimes the worst person can have a seed of goodness in them, as Darth Vader did. That's the legacy of this franchise, more than the special effects or, you know, the quotable lines. What is great about Star Wars is its faith in humanity, and its faith that good can sprout in the unlikeliest of places. We just saw a little scene of, uh, you know, illustrating the ongoing Poe Dameron, uh, Holdo conflict. And no commentary about The Last Jedi would be complete without discussing that. So even though it isn't on screen at the moment, I'm going to talk about it. Basically what the conflict is, is, uh, Poe Dameron 
in a very sexist fashion, refuses to trust Holdo, and uh, ultimately discovers that through his bias, he missed the fact that she was more heroic and clever than he could ever imagine, and he dismissed her intelligence probably because she was a woman. Again, this is another part of the film that, you know, aroused a lot of misogynistic vitriol. And, uh, I hate that. I hate that so much. At the same time, I don't think that the Holdo conflict is handled well or well written at all. Think about, you know, the idea of feminism in action movies. Think about a film like Mad Max Fury Road. Mad Max Fury Road, uh, you know, it, you know, it sends out, you know, a feminist rallying cry. Not by, you know, not through words, not through dialogue, but by, you know, creating these, you know, incredibly powerful women who go on a great heroic journey. The uh, the Poe Dameron conflict, on the other hand, is very didactic. He needs to learn to be more, to be less of a bigot. And uh, in the end, he learns his lesson very neatly. And this idea is, you know, it feels a little on the nose to me. I like the sentiment. I do believe that that archetype of, you know, the trigger-happy, you know, roguish pilot, I certainly believe that's an archetype worthy of being deconstructed. I just don't think it's done well. Oh, God. Here we go. The Fathers. The Fathers. This scene is... Well, it could have been worse. It could have been Gunkins. Nevertheless, I just hate, you know, the... I hate the, this whole bit because if we've got these cute CGI creatures and cute kids kind of mugging for the camera for us, you know, kind of trying to arouse our sympathies in a very cheesy, overwrought sort of way... And also, um, uh, Collider, the gang at Collider Movie Talk, uh, they did a commentary on this scene. Or, well, they did a commentary on the whole film. And one of them, uh, I can't remember who it was, maybe it was Christian Harloff, uh, you know, pointed out that this kind of felt like an animal rights PSA. And I have to agree, and again, it's not like I'm against animal rights, far from it. Um... It's just the PSA part. It does kind of feel like a public service announcement. It feels like a lesson, you know. Freeing animals. Good. Keeping them in captivity. Bad. It feels like you're being lectured. It feels like you're being in school and the teacher's at the blackboard, you know, telling you what's right and what's wrong. And Star Wars, despite the seriousness of, you know, many of the stories told in the Star Wars films, you never want Star Wars to feel like school. Star Wars should be what you go see after school and have a blast with. Have fun, you know, have fun with, frankly, cool explosions and space battles and lightsaber fights. You don't want, it, again, you don't want it to feel didactic. You don't want it to feel overtly educational. I suppose at this point I may as well talk a bit more about the character of Rose. Clearly Kelly Marie Tran is extraordinarily talented. Ryan Johnson's writing of the character, on the other hand, 
not so great. Rose really has no identity. She basically exists to help initiate Finn's transformation. That's a problem. She doesn't really have agency at the end of the day. And in fact, while I certainly am happy to see more, you know, compelling women in Star Wars, when you think about it, some of these women are not as compelling as they could be. Ray, for instance, it doesn't feel like she really has much of a drama in her own in this film. A lot of what she goes through comes from reacting to Luke and Kylo Ren and how she responds to their dramas. And I think part of the problem is that, you know, certainly, you know, any artist can tackle more than they know. There's no question about that, you know. Catherine Bigelow has never been to war, but The Hurt Locker is one of the finest films of the past ten years. Jason Reitman has uh, never been a pregnant teenager, but Juno, likewise, is, you know, one of the finest movies of recent times. But, you know, all these things are subject to talent. Some filmmakers have a harder time telling stories about characters who are different than them. Ryan Johnson is a filmmaker who have made a lot of missteps. His uh, film, The Brothers Bloom, which he made after Brick, was a total mess. And while Looper got many good reviews and has its fans, I think Looper is a mess as well. And uh, The Last Jedi, I don't know if it's necessarily a mess, but it is certainly, as uh, um, they said in the Red Letter Media review, it is messy. And... uh, Oh my god, I lost my train of thought. This is the problem with doing long-form stuff. Um, uh, I really enjoy the scene uh, where Luke and Leia connect. Nice callback to the Empire Strikes Back. Now we come to something that I do not enjoy, enjoy quite as much. Ray asking Kylo Ren, why did you hate your father? And I think it was so shocking in The Force Awakens when Kylo Ren did kill Han Solo. And, uh, I don't know, it begs for a greater explanation. Perhaps the explanation is that, you know, he, you know, Kylo Ren despises Luke for trying to kill him, as we'll talk about later. And, um, uh, you know, he resents Han for allowing him to enter into Luke's tutelage. Perhaps that's it. I'll get into um, uh, some of my thoughts on what Luke does in a bit. But I will say I find it interesting that in both The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi we have flashbacks. There were never flashbacks in Star Wars until now. Never. Not once. Uh, Even when the characters talked about the past, especially Obi-Wan, you know, talking about, you know, training Anakin, there was, um, uh, you know, we didn't actually see it. We didn't, you know, do little flashes of it. George Lucas trusted that Alec Guinness's voice, you know, describing these events, was all that we needed. And I like that. And I think... I see that, you know, Ryan Johnson was trying to do a... Uh, something inspired by Rashomon, or um, uh, the film Hero, where we see different versions of events in flashback. 
until we get to the truth. But I still feel like flashbacks are not, if you'll pardon the word, very Star Wars-y. I feel that Star Wars is very rooted in the impulse of the present moment. And if you, uh, if you do flashbacks, it just doesn't feel quite right. It doesn't feel like Star Wars. But then again, detective movies, uh, detective stories, film noir, do use flashbacks quite a bit. And Ryan Johnson, uh, all his movies until now have been examples of film noir. Brick is a, a detective movie. The Brothers Bloom is, is a con man movie. Uh, Looper is sort of tech noir in the vein of The Terminator. It's not surprising that given that Ryan Johnson wrote and directed this film, that there would be a strain of noir in his DNA. Even DJ, you know, the shady character they have to, you know, make a bargain with, there's a noir vibe to him. This is clearly the equivalent of Luke's vision in the cave and the Empire Strikes Back. And I just have to take a minute to laugh about how Rey goes under the water and her hairstyle changes. <laughs> and it ends up looking like a Qui-Gon Jinn's back in The Phantom Menace. And I don't have a problem with that because I think both Rey and Qui-Gon Jinn are pretty badass. But I do wonder how this is going to work. Does, uh, does Ray get a different hairstyle for each film in the trilogy? First uh, film was the, the Three Knobs. This is, um, uh, you know, the you know, half up, half down. Will there be a new look in Episode Nine? Actually, I, I do want to say something serious about um, uh, her hair. I, uh, I saw an article online about, you know, the, the hair of, you know, women in superhero movies. And they pointed out how um, uh, how totally impractical a lot of these hairstyles are, you know, like these women like have this you know long hair, you know, like just kind of worn down that could like get in their face or you know block their vision in the middle of a fight, but you know the filmmakers usually men, you know, want them to look hot, you know, want them to look stylish, while the men you know get to have a style that's functional and essentially makes sense. Um, I think it's kind of cool that, you know, Ray's hairstyles in these movies are always very practical, you know. She keeps it out, always keeps it out of her face. You know, it's some, uh, she isn't all dolled up to, you know, look as sexy as possible in a fight. You know, the filmmakers were smart enough to know that, hey, you know, she's out, you know, battling stormtroopers and Kylo Ren, you know. She would want, like, a functional hairstyle that, you know, wouldn't get in her eyes or what have you. It's pretty cool. I do find it odd, though, that um, uh, in the span of just a few scenes, Ray goes from hating Kylo Ren and calling, you know, believing he's a monster to believing that, you know, he can be turned to the good side. I know that she feels something from touching his hand, but still, it feels a bit sloppy, you know? I mean, I got the idea in the original trilogy. Luke learns that Darth Vader is his, fa is his father, you know, just because we all want to believe the best of our, you know, our parents, he wants to believe that, you know, he can turn Vader, and that makes sense. It doesn't quite make sense to me how Rey can believe that there's good in Kylo Ren, Although I do um, uh, understand the idea that, you know, she's alone. She's looking for, you know, a contemporary. You know, another kid in the midst of this grand drama of good versus evil who maybe understands what it is to be gifted and burdened with great power. And also, she's a kid. I think she's a little attracted to the bad boy. But I want to get a good head start on talking about this revelation here that Luke contemplated uh, um, uh, Ky killing Kylo Ren in his sleep. There are some things in this film that, you know, 
I may not like, but I can roll with. I can say, well, that's not my interpretation of Star Wars, but I understand the thought. This, I cannot. Luke Skywalker looked into the heart of Darth Vader, the most evil tyrant of the galaxy, and believed he could not be beyond redemption. He had faith. He had faith that there could be a way to save Vader. That was the great thing about Luke, that his belief could be so strong. To then tarnish that by saying, Luke, you know, essentially, on the whim of a vision, contemplating killing a young boy while he was in bed, that tarnishes this great hero whose, uh, whose hope, whose belief means so much to all of us and is so inspiring. I know, you can make all these excuses. He evolved, he changed, he didn't really do it. I don't buy it for a second. Again, Star Wars is supposed to be aspirational. It's not just supposed to show us the world as it is. It's supposed to show us the world that can, it, that can be to inspire us to choose the light side over the dark, to inspire us to, like Luke, believe the best in people, to believe that the world can be changed. And to sully that, I think, is just plain wrong. I don't care if it's realistic. I don't care if it adds depth. To me, it is just wrong. And again, he doesn't take the lightsaber. There is a bit of poetry in that she's always holding it out to him. And even when he holds the lightsaber at the end, he is an apparition. We don't really see it. Which means that the last time we saw him uh, holding a lightsaber for real was in Return of the Jedi when he tossed it away. There is something a little interesting about the idea that Luke never uh, wields a weapon again. Okay, he wielded that staff, but that's a stick we're talking about. Some of these shots of Yoda the puppet, some of them look totally weird and fake. Some of them look pretty darn good. There's some complaints about, you know, how can Yoda call down lightning to, you know, burn down a tree? Well... I don't think that the, the ghosts of Star Wars have to have any sort of logic, frankly. I don't think that at all. There's nothing wrong with keeping things a little mysterious. Mystery and wonder have always been key to Star Wars. Especially since so much of it hinges on the Force, which is this thing we can't even see. Uh, there's a great podcast called The Director's Cut, where directors interview each other. The Directors Guild of America created it. Spike Jones interviewed Ryan Johnston about The Last Jedi, and uh, started out asking a really beautiful question, which was, uh, what did the Force mean to you growing up? And that's what inspired that idea, um, was something Ryan Johnston thought about, you know, creating the film. He um, uh, wrote that bit where Luke explains what the Force is to Rey in, in a way to better understand what it all means. Or for at least for the audience to understand. I always thought that was kind of intriguing. Still looking to the horizon, Yoda tells him, saying the same wisdom as from Empire. I once read someone who, uh, you know, Mark Hamill said Luke's greatest uh, trait was his hope, his ability to hope, and a writer countered by saying Luke's defining trait was whininess. 
But that's only looking at the surface level. Luke was a whiny kid. But, you know, the confrontation with Darth Vader and learning that, you know, this evil tyrant is his father shocks him out of that. And he's a much more reflective character in Return of the Jedi. That's another thing I don't like, you know, in The Last Jedi. It's been the same, you know, writer said, can't remember who it was off the top of my head, um, uh, that, you know, Luke's attitude in this film fits with his whininess. But he grew beyond that. And again, it feels not that the characters are evolving, but they're being kind of reverted to the status quo. Although I do like what Luke says, that, um, uh, you know, the greatest, or what Yoda says, failure is the greatest teacher of all. And that the burden of all masters is that our students grow beyond us. I think that's one of the most powerful themes in Star Wars. Rey grows beyond Luke, just as Luke once grew beyond Obi-Wan and Yoda, who both told him, you have to face your father again in battle. Luke chose a different path. He chose to redeem his father instead. And uh, he, proved, he, he was proven right that there was good invader. And that, um, therefore, you know, every generation, at least ideally, ideally speaking, advances beyond the last. Learn some new wisdom. Gets to some idea that the previous generation couldn't get to. Star Wars has always been, as I said, elemental and... That, I think, is one of the elemental truths of life. Although, sadly, in this day and age, it sometimes feel like, feels like the world is going in circles. We had an interesting conversation about this scene um, where DJ, you know, shows a weapons dealer who is stealing to both the... Um, the uh, resistance and the first order and has this line where he says you know war is a machine don't join don't join adding to the idea there's no good there's no evil you know war is one big scam the point was raised during one of the reviews we did here at THO that you know maybe this idea is a little too modern for Star Wars Uh, it was Patrick who said that the politics of Star Wars maybe were more like classical Greek politics, and this is a very 21st century idea, this idea about weapons manufacturing and the moral ambiguity of it all. I think it's an interesting thing to contemplate. I really do. I do appreciate, however, that it's bringing a layer to Star Wars that we haven't seen before. Interesting how, you know, Poe says to Admiral Holdo, Vice Admiral Holdo, cut it, lady. Calls her lady. Doesn't even address her by her um, uh, her rank. Everyone wants to defend Poe, but, you know, while I don't necessarily like how this plot is written, there's no denying it. You know, sexism fuels his actions. What would be really interesting is if there was a true ideological conflict within the resistance about how to proceed. Because we never saw that in the original trilogy. An ideological conflict that goes beyond, you know, a man not just not trusting his commanding officer. Now the argument is always raised, why does um, uh, Holdo not just tell Poe? Well, for the same reason that, you know, in Star Trek The Next Generation, Captain Jean-Luc Picard didn't always tell every single person on the ship what he was planning. The commanding officer's responsibility is not to keep everyone informed, necessarily. Especially not someone like Poe, who's been demoted. That was another point made in the Collider commentary. Why doesn't she just kill Poe? Or, or why doesn't she just tell Poe, not kill Poe? <laughs> um, the point was made, well, she shouldn't have to. 
And again, while I'm not a fan of the writing of that whole storyline, I don't disagree. She shouldn't have to. So I believe it was on the fan-made Kylo Ren Twitter account. They had Kylo Ren tweeting, Guys, I brought some handcuffs to a date. Hope I wasn't being too forward. And uh, that, uh, it was a joke, of course. But honestly, there has always been a strain of S&M in Rey and Kylo Ren's relationship. You look at the first film where, you know, from the minute, you know, the subordinate says, you know, tells him there was a girl and he says, what girl? He's interested in her. How does he respond? He ties her to a table and offers to be her teacher. And in this film, he has her handcuffed after appearing shirtless before her in a vision. Uh, there is definitely some uh, stuff about dominance and submission going on in that plot line. Of course, and very much to Ray's credit, while she does seem to be a little taken in by Ren, she ultimately resists. The first ever trash can in Star Wars. We've seen a trash compactor, but never a trash can. Um, oh, in a, se- in a second, we see the uh, um, evil version of BB Hate, who Mo, Mo Shawnette, who, uh, if you follow the THO, I'm sure you're familiar with his wonderful work. Um, uh, he says this droid is called BB Hate. I like that very much. And there you see uh, the elevator going up. It's uh, carrying Rey and Kylo Ren. Uh, very nice scene transition. Call back to Return of the Jedi here, you know, with two characters, one who's trying to redeem the other in an elevator. Perhaps it's a bit too similar. While this film does go into different in different directions than uh, previous Star Wars films, it does feel like it's reacting to those old directions, even when it contradicts them. And reacting and contradicting something is still, in a sense, being a slave to it. There's that line that is uh, has been quoted to death: "Let the past die, kill it if you have to." But in a way. This film still doesn't take enough risks. It still feels beholden to the original trilogy. This film is really The Empire Strikes Back, but with a version of the climax from Return of the Jedi shoehorned in. Although it doesn't play out quite the same way, to be fair. The spit where DJM uh, gives the hazy and smell back, I think that's a very good bit of character development. I strongly dislike the character of DJ. I think he's one-dimensional, 
I think that um, uh, Benito del Toro's stutter was a pretentious affectation that was designed to create eccentricity and really did not pay off. But the moment when he gives the hazy and smelt back, I like that there's nuance to the character. Yes, he betrays them later on, but he's not incapable of compassion. And uh, that's a welcome level of nuance. Something I was wrong about, by the way, I felt uh, initially that, you know, Finn and Rose's whole plan, the fact that it was a failure, makes this whole bit of the plot unnecessary. I realize in retrospect that, you know, that that failure is in a way essential. A good story is a series of surprises. A good story continually catches you off guard. And the fact that they go to Canto Bight and it turns out to be pretty much for nothing, that certainly is a surprise. It's quite a dark story when you think about it. Because of what Finn and Rose and Poe plan, a huge, huge portion of the resistance gets decimated. That's quite bold. And, you know, I mean, mistakes like theirs can have serious consequences in here just as they do in real life. But here's the problem I have with it. You know, you look back at Man of Steel. Um, a lot of people complained about, you know, these huge portions of Metropolis getting absolutely decimated. And, you know, the argument from the people involved in the film was, you know, well, there have to be casualties. There, you know, there have, realistically, there have to be casualties if you're dealing with a fight like that. And to those people, I say, you are missing the point. It's like, uh, you know, I, I believe Roger Ebert said this, it's not what a movie's about, it's how it's about it. And the thing in Man of Steel was... We had all those casualties, but they were never really reflected on. You never saw a moment where Superman had this sense of guilt and would say, My God, look at all the destruction I'm responsible for. That's on Zod, but that's also on me. I played a role in that. And similarly, we never get a chance for, you know, Finn and Rose and Poe to say, My God, look what we've done. Look at the price we paid. And I feel that that kind of takes some of the meaning out of it. Because realistically, if you were responsible for that much loss and sacrifice, that is how you would react. That's what you would be feeling. And uh, it takes the sting out of it to um, uh, not have that be the case. Especially with Poe, because he very neatly, you know, is leading the resistance at the end. And it's, it's also Titan. But I'll get into that later. Look at Ray in that shot, almost uh, exactly positioned in the center between the, the two walls framing the entrance. Well, not quite in the center, but, you know, it's like uh, Dustin Morrow, who uh, I mentioned earlier, taught us, you know, a good shot in uh, a film has lines that draw your attention to important points. In both these shots, you see lines, visual lines, drawing your attention to Ray and Snoke. You know, there's even lines on the back of Snoke's chair. Kylo Ren, on the other hand, is visually a bit off-center. Um, uh, he's not framed exactly in the middle of something like Rey and Snoke are. 
Perhaps that's because uh, Ray and Snoke are very clear in their purpose. Snoke is solidly evil. Ray is almost solidly good. Kylo Ren is uh, a bit less certain of himself. But it's always important when you can find a way through visuals to symbolize what's going on emotionally, as long as it makes sense. And you know, now we see Kylo Ren looking tormented. It's very important in Star Wars that you have, you know, tough moments where a hero has to make a choice. By the way, great moment there, cutting from Rey in pain to Poe waking up at the start. Great match cut. But this idea of choices, you know, Luke choosing uh, to leave Tatooine. Han choosing to come back and help destroy the Death Star. Luke choosing to redeem his father. Leia choosing to tell Han how she feels about him. There's always been moments, you know, in Star Wars where characters make surprising choices and uh, reveal who they are in their heart. And we get uh, a lot of that with Kylo Ren in a second. He reveals heart, his heart in uh, some pretty telling ways. And then that beacon comes back to Leia. I suppose it symbolizes her reassuming the mantle after being out of commission. Or perhaps she takes it away from Poe symbolizing that uh, that he's not ready to take her place yet. Rose says to uh, DJ, you lying snake, uh, earlier, uh, Ray called Kylo Ren a murderous snake. A lot of snake insults in this film. This Red Room gets an awful lot of kudos. And I've heard more than one person say this is the best looking Star Wars film yet. To people I say that who say that, I say this. Maybe you didn't see a little film called The Empire Strikes Back. Ray looking out of the fleet being destroyed. A uh, call back to Luke. Seeing a very similar thing at the climax of Return of the Jedi. And a confusing shot of Snoke that makes him look much bigger than he actually is. There are a number of those. But this brilliant image of the lightsaber landing at Kylo Ren's feet, tempting him. Which side will you choose? Which side will you choose? There's something very potent about that. Again, this idea of choice.
I do agree with people who wish we'd gotten more development of Snoke, because it feels very strange, you know, we see all the Sith and destroyed in Return of the Jedi, and where does the Snoke Kai come from? How does he rise to power? It feels weird that he just appears. But he was also a very boring one-dimensional character, and I was not sad to see him go. And, you know, in any Star Wars movie, you want to have these great moments, like this one we're about to see. Where we're taken by surprise. Star Wars is all about surprises. And this moment is not just Snoke being destroyed. It's Ryan Johnson killing off a character who was basically a boring retread of Emperor Palpatine from the original trilogy and uh, ridding the franchise of him of it. The approach of Johnson, who wants to push things in fresh directions versus Abrams, who wants to rehash the past. You feel in this film the war of two sensibilities. Johnson taking what he was given from Abrams, but uh, trying to undo some of the familiarity. Although, as I said before, the film still falls into some of these, some of the same old traps. Now, undeniably, I certainly have qualms with this movie, but this is a brilliant scene. It's not the best lightsaber duel, as some people have claimed. That would be uh, the duel between Luke and uh, Vader and the Empire Strikes Back. On the other hand, it's pretty brilliantly choreographed. Look at how it's constructed editorially. The duel is really broken into chapters. We stay with Rey for a chunk of time, then we go over to Kylo Ren for a chunk of time. And if you look, the choreography is very clear. It's it's very easy to track each parry. It's there. See there, you know, it switches over to Rey, switches back to Ren. It doesn't jump around too much. And look, that shot there. This This shot is quite long. With Kylo Ren wailing against these Praetorian guards. Lots of wide shots. Not too many close-ups. Things are very clear. It's, it's very classical. And also, we have that moment at the beginning where Kylo Ren attempts to attack Snoke and the Praetorian guards uh, light up their weapons. So we know they have weapons, setting up this moment later. And this is good storytelling. Again, the idea of surprises. We come in expecting the battle to be with Snoke, and then the battle's with these guards who are just standing around. And so we don't end up, they don't end up fighting who they expect to fight. And there's something very potent about that. And yet once it clicks into place, it's, of course... It makes sense narratively, because Kylo Ren, you know, was told by his own father, look, Snoke's going to do away with you when the time comes, and he knows he can't let that happen. Now, one point that was raised in our reviews was that, you know, it's been said in, in, in more than one place that Kylo Ren is saying, Join me and we won't be good, we won't be evil, you know, we'll just be power. I don't think that's what he's saying at all. Ray asks him, you know, don't stop destroying the fleet. Kylo Ren says no. He cl still clearly sides with the First Order. He is asking Ray to join him. This isn't some, anything morally ambiguous. He is asking her to join the dark side. When he says let the Sith and the Jedi die, 
Well, the Sith and the Jedi, those are just two religions, two disciples of the Force. He's still asking her to join the dark side. They were filthy junk traders who sold the offer drinking money. Again, a controversial thing. I don't mind it. Now, I disagree with people who say that Star Wars has always promoted royal bloodlines because Luke was an everyman in his own right. He only learned later that, you know, his father was someone of significance. But I think there's pot something potent about the idea of saying, you know, you've looked your whole life for your parents. And they're nobody. You have to define yourself on your own terms. And what's going on with Kylo Ren here, I think, is, you know, while Kylo Ren is a dumb character, you know, a knockoff of Darth Vader essentially going down the same path with just a little bit of a, more of a pout, still, it's a really potent moment for him. Rey gives him the chance to join her. Even after all he's done, she has it in her heart to forgive him. And yet he still doesn't take that chance. And that how you, is how you know he's truly evil. By this point, he's committed so many crimes. Most people would say he doesn't deserve forgiveness. He doesn't deserve a chance for redemption. Ray has a big enough heart to offer him that chance anyway. And he still doesn't take it. He still can't let go of his need for power. That's what makes him such a tragic villain. And this is the moment where Rey makes her choice. Yes, I have affection for you. Yes, I have sympathy for you. But I know who I am. And I am not going to submit to you. So this moment of silence we have coming up, where um, uh, Holdo goes to hyperspace, apparently some theaters had to warn audiences who were confused by it, you know, no, the sound's not going out, it's an artistic choice. I gotta say, if we've come to that point, if where something like that is considered bold and out of the box, yikes. It's nothing that Kubrick didn't do back in 2001, people. It's just like when the, the Three Kings DVD, at the beginning it says, the filmmakers use color distortion, you know, for artistic effect, or some words to that effect. It's like, people can't figure that out? Really? I truly believe that audiences are smarter than they're given credit for. At the same time, I think, you know, main, I think audiences, you know, all of us, need to open our minds to uh, stuff that's bold and pushes the envelope. If, if people, you know, think the sound actually went out well in the theater, well, then that's, that's a sign that, you know, maybe that's on Hollywood, too. Hollywood needs to push the envelope more, which certainly is true. This is the moment where Finn's uh, destiny is sealed. He meets his maker. He battles his former commanding officer, Mano a Mano. It should have had more resonance, but unfortunately, because the whole Canto Bite thing was uh, such a weak, weak uh, setup for Finn's transformation, this doesn't this payoff doesn't mean as much. And also, how irritating is that little thing with BB-8 there in the at, -AT walker? I mean, God. Sorry, BB-8 fans, I can't stand that character. See, the thing about the droids in the original trilogy, with R2 and 3PO, they each had a specific personality. 3PO was a fussy, you know, fearful, cowardly guy. He acted how, you know, most normal people would act if they were dropped in the middle of Star Wars. 
R2 was kind of an annoyingly, you know, calm and collected guy who wasn't afraid of danger, you know? And so there was a specific personality. There's no personality for BB-8. He just kind of mugs for the camera. You know, like that moment when Ray says he can come with her in the first film, and he go and The Force Awakens, and he goes, meow, meow. and it's like we're supposed to go, oh, so cute. Again, that's the problem with these movies. There's entertaining, and there's trying too hard to entertain. And when you find you're doing things simply to entertain rather than move the story forward, inserting things like that bit with Chewie trying to eat the poor, you know, that don't belong in the plot and they're just there to be cute or funny, you know, well, then you've become distracting and you've become ingratiating. And that's another quality in the Marvel films, you know, trying excessively hard to charm. And it's like, I say to modern filmmakers, don't worry so much about trying to be charming. Don't worry so much about trying to be entertaining. Just focus on telling a well-structured, compelling, engaging story, and that will be all the entertainment people need. You don't need to kind of scream, you know, at people, ooh, ah, laugh, you know? It doesn't work like that. And Hux quietly tries to pretend he didn't just try to kill Kylo Ren. There is something very interesting about the idea, and this is one thing that I think the uh, these newer Star Wars films do that they're quite original. Now we have the First Order being run by Kylo Ren and Hux, this massive, massive military force run by these petulant, snotty young guys who are driven by their whims and their egos and their most childish impulses. There is something truly frightening about that. Something truly terrifying. Uh, I once saw that, you know, someone compared Kylo Ren to a school shooter. And uh, there's something to that, because, you know, what's frightening about, you know, students who have gone into schools and, you know, massacred people, it's frightening that, you know, the idea of, you know, you know, I don't know where I'm going with this. The, 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 the shoot, school shooter metaphor, honestly, maybe, maybe is a bit step too far. But it's terrifying, you know, seeing these, these petulant guys who are, whose emotions are so out of control, seeing them running the show. And by the way, why did Leia wait to shut the door until the whole First Order was bearing down? There is no theory that could explain that. That was totally bogus.
in this scene here, I really don't understand uh, why the guy with the long white hair and beard just stands out there where anyone could shoot him. <laughs> I don't like to be, you know, to whine and nitpick about plot holes or, you know, things like that, but that's pretty weird. That's a great detail right there. Uh, Poe's foot popping through the bottom of his speeder. And we cut to a wide shot there of all the speeders. To give a sense of, you know, it's it's always important. Again, great use of wide shots in this film, you know. Of course, in the duel between with Rey and Kylo Ren. But also, if you notice back when uh, Finn was fighting Captain Phasma, that was filmed in wide shots as well. Bob Doucet, uh, Ryan Johnson's longtime collaborator, edited this film. Steve Yedlin shot it. And again, there's a there's a real classical style. It's not it's it's fluid, not fragmented. And Star Wars has always been very fluid. You know, it's funny because intercutting multiple sequences has always been a big part of the films, you know. Of course, going back to the Empire Strikes Back and the duel with uh, Darth Vader. And Luke intercut with uh, Leia and Lando and Chewie's escape from Cloud City, you know. Same thing in the first film with, you know, multiple threads on the Death Star, you know, Obi-Wan's mission, Luke and Han's mission, Vader. These films derive incredible energy from cross-cutting and parallel action. And yet at the same time, you know, the editing rhythms have never been choppy. Not like, you know, in a Bourne film or a Christopher Nolan film. They've always just been fluid and clean. The Last Jedi continues in that tradition. You know, I was uh, watching a video, which, uh, the, the basically this topic was, Star Wars can't succeed without George Lucas. He is the essential ingredient. Whatever his flaws, you need his perspective and his personality to make, to truly make a Star Wars film. And I think it's interesting, you know, George Lucas was always pushing, he was always an innovator. And this video pointed out, that, you know, these newer films really don't do that. You know, this planet here, Crate, it may be a mineral planet, but it's a big white planet. It, it looks exactly like Hoth in The Empire Strikes Back, or even Starkiller Base in The Force Awakens. And, you know, I think while we were watching the prequels, a lot of us fans were, you know, really irritated by the digital effects and longed to get back to the older, grittier look with, uh, you know, hand-built sets and practical effects. I'm sure we all wanted them to be shot on film. And now it's interesting, Star Wars is doing all those things again. And the odd thing is, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I know a lot of us are, are starting to, you know, kind of miss the innovative spirit of Lucas, even when it didn't pay off. These films are really just trying to, chasing the brilliant visual style of uh, the original trilogy. And they look great. I mean, you know, you look at these shots, there's texture to the images, there's grit. The images are, uh, are pretty three-dimensional, you know, the lighting is clear when it needs to be, but, you know, there's shadow when there needs to be as well. But it's mimicking something familiar. 
It's mimicking a visual style that, yes, we all like, yes, we all admire, but it's, uh, it's still an imitation. Oh, and here we go, here we go. Finn's quote-unquote sacrifice. There are just some moments in this film that are truly baffling, that truly fall into the what were they thinking category. I never wanted Finn to, to die. It would be a mistake to, you know, kill uh, the character who is, you know, the secondary protagonist. Uh, I think of Rey as the protagonist of these new films. It would be a mistake to kill the secondary protagonist this early in the trilogy. At the same time, this whole thing where Rose saves him is so ridiculous. Rose recognizes the importance of sacrifice. Her own sister sacrificed herself at the beginning of the film. She's devoted to the resistance. And yet she puts everyone's lives at risk by stopping Finn from taking out the battering ram cannon. And I wonder about that. I, I find it odd. I find it odd that she would put one life before everyone else's, because she didn't know that Luke was about to show up and save their bacon. So they either should have played this differently, or what they could have done is have, uh, you know, a line where Rose says something to the effect of, I know it was wrong, I sh should have let you die, but I couldn't lose one more person. Again, it's not what it's about, it's how it's about it. You contextualize that moment, it might make more sense. Although nothing about this kiss makes sense. A <laughs> kiss in front of a giant explosion? <laughs> it almost feels like I mean, I don't think she, I think she likes him, but I don't know if she respects him to, you know, plant one on him. Because, you know, she's essentially been teaching him, and he's been following her lead. I don't think that's the kind of thing that in, would endear romantic affection. It almost just feels like they're having them kiss because it's like, oh... Someone's got a kiss in this movie. The galaxy has lost all its hope. The spark gets out. Again, on the nose sentimentality. It doesn't feel like Star Wars. It feels cheesy. It's like, cut that line. Just hold the camera on Leia's face. See her pain. That's all we need. Just as, you know, at the climax of Return of the Jedi, when Darth Vader, you know, is seeing Luke being tortured, we don't need the line where James Earl Jones says, I am so tormented. You don't need that. All you needed was the image of Darth Vader's mask to know that this is tormenting him. It's the Kuleshov effect. Shots create meaning in connection with one another. You don't always, you don't need dialogue to do it. It's just, it's too obvious. It's too blunt. On this line about, oh, I changed my hair because all anyone knows about Princess Leia is her hair. It's like, come on. You don't need to have a joke there. I came to face him, Leia. So much like when he was trying to, uh, when he wanted to redeem his father back in Return of the Jedi, although this time he says, I can't save him. But at the same time, he says, no one's ever really gone. I don't like the way Luke was handled in this movie. Nothing can persuade me. But this moment when he walks out onto the battlefield that's coming out up and the John Williams score 
People watching in wonder as this legendary hero strides onto the battlefield alone. There's something magnificent about that. It is a movie moment. It is a movie moment that fills you with wonder and awe. The great Jedi Master of old, facing on an army alone. This is high drama, my friends. This is what we pay for when we pay to see a Star Wars movie. Although there are uh, perhaps a surfeit in this scene of really big, dramatic, important shots, all capitals. You know, Luke, oh, everyone's always framed in silhouette against the sunset, and it almost feels like, look how important and dramatic everything is. This moment coming up where Luke, uh, you know, brushes off his shoulder. Like most of the humor in this film, not a fan of it. It feels like yet another example of humor designed to, in, in awkwardly inserted to deflate the tension for an easy laugh, as opposed to, uh, you know, arising organically from the situation. And more to the point, I don't think that's what Luke would do. I think Luke would simply stand there, and that would be that much more powerful. And these jokes, you know, where Kylo Ren impulsively uses the Force against someone, and, you know, everyone obeys... I kind of feel like, you know, cheap knockoffs of similar jokes about Darth Vader back in the original trilogy. I wonder what rationale Ryan give, Johnson would give for the question of why Luke believes he can't save Kylo Ren. Is it because Kylo Ren feels betrayed by him, him and then can never trust him again? Is it that Luke has changed? I still think that the real Luke might still believe he could do that, save Kylo Ren. What are you looking at me for? Follow him. God, that line. 
I get into arguments all the time about Poe's trajectory in this film. A lot of people think it's so great that he gets taken down a peg, and will all fight me on this. But here's what I think. I think it's so banal. He learns his le lesson quite easily, quite simply. He's responsible for a lot of death in the process, but he seems weirdly unbothered by it. And again, it's so tidy, it's so educational, the way he learns to be a team player. Whoa. You know, I like... I. Real life is not like that, you know. Okay, I'm being hypocritical now. I'm talking about, you know, real life. I said Star Wars doesn't have to be real life. Okay, maybe I need to rephrase this. You know, it's more interesting dramatically if characters grow not in a tidy way, but in a messy way. Just like the way Han, you know, learns to stand by Leia and the Alliance and the Empire Strikes Back but not in a tidy way, in the, you know, he loses everything in the process. He pays the price. He gets sealed in carbonite. Growing and learning is messy. Growing and learning typically doesn't mean you get to do what Poe does, which is, you know, just jauntily walk off and you've won the day. The original Star Wars films allowed for messy character arcs. All this is so tidy. And messiness... Messiness is an inherent part of great art. But God do I love this moment here. And I will... I if. You'll humor me. I'd like to just simply read Luke's lines. The rebellion is reborn today. The war is just beginning. And I will not be the last Jedi. And then cut to Rey defiantly uh, uh, opening the rock face. What a moment of sheer hope. All of these characters have suffered. And then a flash of light. And this is something that truly is bold. Remember, The Empire Strikes Back was such a grim film. But Ryan Johnson had the audacity to say that, you know, while things certainly, the characters had to be tested in these films, you could end in a more hopeful way. You could do that differently. And by the way, that moment back there of Finn and Ray hugging, what a powerful thing it is to see a young black man and a young white woman hugging each other in a Star Wars movie. Just think, there was a time in cinema history, really not that long ago in the grand scheme of things, when no studio would have the balls to do that. I don't have a problem with the astral projection. It's a fun surprise. I do have a problem with what follows it. So I like Kylo Ren shouting no here. What's a big budget movie without someone going no? But this moment here with Luke dying and looking at a sunset and you can tell Ryan Johnson thought he was so clever. 
Luke comes full circle. It's just like in A New Hope when he watched the twin sunset looking for adventure. Now he's older and wiser and he looks at the sunset again and he's at peace. So tidy, so clean, so poetic. I say to that, no. Ryan Johnson, I admire you. You've got some talent. But your big important moment, it's lame. It's just lame. It's not as cool as you think it is. I didn't. I didn't. Don't. Didn't approve of Luke attempting to kill or contemplating killing Kylo Ren in his sleep. I don't approve of showing Luke's death on screen. I don't approve of showing you know Han or Leia's death on screen either. You know what? I know I keep saying this, but you know. Star Wars should, while frightening us and challenging us, it should also give us hope. And to see these characters we grew up with, to see them grow and now we have to see them die, I'm sorry, that's just too depressing. That just feels wrong to me. If this is what they were going to do with Luke, Han, and Leia, then they never should have been included them in the films at all. Do those characters the honor, they should have done them the honor, of at least, of letting them die happily. You see, here's the thing. The promise of the original trilogy was that Han, Luke, and Leia were cleaning up the flaws of a previous generation that allowed the galaxy to descend into fascism. And the idea was that, you know, Luke, Han, and Leia, because of what they did, could all live in a better world than their parents had. And to undo that, to say, oh no, another version of the Empire will rise, and Luke, Han, and Leia will all die with the war unfinished, having to be okay with thing history just repeating itself depressingly. That's realistic, sure. But is it right? Is it right? Because I think we all need to believe that we can build a better world. And that, you know, even if our parents, you know, lived through terrible things, we can die in a peaceful, better, more optimistic world. The view of this, uh, the view that, you know, Star Wars, you know, in this, these new films promotes, is that that's not possible. The view here is that we all go through the motions. History repeats itself. Empires fall and then rise again, and yet more, even more rebellions have to be marshaled. That may be life. But, you know... The original Star Wars trilogy gave us more than a reflection of life. It gave us a vision of what we could all be capable of. This film does not. I like the idea behind this final scene. I like the idea behind it. The idea that, you know, as Ryan Johnson described it in that DGA interview with Spike Jones, that hope is spreading across the galaxy. And that, you know, a young kid is looking to the stars. The war is not over. There's still many battles to fight. But hope is swelling. Determination is rising. There's something beautiful about that. But again, having it be a bunch of cute little kids, it, it kind of feels like mugging for the camera again. Trying to work us. And also, the original trilogy was about how a boy becomes a man. While Rey is not the only main character of this trilogy, she is the central figure. So therefore, this new trilogy is about how a girl becomes a woman. In a reflection of that, it should have been a young girl. The next Rey, there at the end. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this commentary. I have. It's always intriguing and enlightening 
to voyage through The Last Jedi from the good parts to the bad parts to the parts in between. But I want to say one more thing. The most important thing I think to address is the ugliness that, you know, has come out in this film. Or that, you know, has come out in people's responses to this film. The racism, the misogyny. This film has been a flashpoint. And it has, you know, revealed the sickness of the spirit that, you know, continues to affect this country. You could say, you know, it's all a side effect of Trump's America, but, you know, the hate has always been there. It's just gotten a lot more vocal lately uh, via Trump and the alt-right. So I wanted to speak to that. And I wanted to speak to one more thing. I can see that this movie has affected a lot of people. And people's reactions do not lie. You see, some people think that, you know, we react to films in a calculated way, or that we have an agenda in our reactions. But the way a person feels about a film is like alchemy. You can't exactly say why. It's very pure. You either like it and enjoy it, or you do not. No one likes a film and then, you know, says, Oh, but actually I don't like it because of this reason. I think people are very honest in their reactions. That's just my opinion. Which is why I'm trying to say, I respect I, be, that people love this film. Because I can tell that it has made quite an impact on some people, and they really feel deeply about it. And, you know, that love, like all movie love, I think is beautiful. But I do have to criticize a lot of aspects of this film, and I want to speak to something else. This film has been called bold. It's been called risk-taking. There are some elements that I think do that. There are some elements that do not. But I do want to say, and I kind of spoke to this before, but I want to go into a bit more depth. This is not truly bold cinema. Truly bold cinema is the tree of life. Truly bold cinema is moonlight. Truly bold cinema is mother. Aaron Aronofsky's film. Truly bold cinema are movies where you go, wow, I could have never imagined doing that in that way. I didn't know that was possible. This is just a film that tweaks an old formula in a couple ways. That's not bold. That's not fresh. That's taking the minimum amount of risk. And I want to speak to something else. You see, how do I put this? This movie has gotten people into a lot of arguments about what Star Wars is. And Star Wars, as I said, is broad. It is, you know, a fairy tale. And fairy tales, because of their narrative simplicity, are opened to a lot of interpretation. But here's what I think Star Wars is. People think Star Wars is a universe. I don't think that. I think Star Wars is a story. I think Star Wars is the story of how Luke Skywalker becomes a man and redeems his father, Darth Vader. I think that's what Star Wars is. The rest of it, the ships, the locations, the special effects, those are part of the appeal, but they're not nearly as core to the appeal as that one dramatic story. You go beyond that, you lose the franchise's raison d'etre. 
And these these films, they don't feel at the end of the day like they have a raison d'etre. Making the Star Wars galaxy more diverse, that's a noble goal. That, I think, is probably reason enough to for these films to exist. But in terms of narrative terms, in terms of artistic terms, they don't capture that old Star Wars feeling where you are desperate to find out what happens next. They don't feel consequential. And that's because they're not personal. The original trilogy came from George Lucas's soul. He was a guy who grew up, his father wanted him to you know, go into the office supplies uh, business in Modesto, California, just like Luke Skywalker's uncle wanted him to stay on the farm. And George Lucas, like Luke, went on great adventures, the adventure of filmmaking. He was making something personal. He was something that came from the heart. J.J. Abrams, Ryan Johnson, they're doing something that came from George Lucas's heart. And therefore, it's less personal. And the truth is, at the end of the day, these films didn't exist because, you know, someone said, hey, I got an idea for a great story to tell, which is how the original trilogy came to be. These new films exist because Disney wrote a check. People say, oh, you know, the film business is a business. That's why it's called the film business. And I say yes, but money can't be the only reason to make a film. There has to be another reason. And I don't think these films have given me a good enough reason to believe that there is. So let me ask you. Imagine for a second that Lucasfilm said, hey, let's stop making Star Wars. Instead, let's do something true to the spirit of Star Wars, which would be to tell an original story that would fill people with wonder again, show them things they truly had not seen. Do something into the spirit of Lucas the Innovator, Lucas the Trailblazer. Imagine for a moment that instead of these films, we had a film with the same cast, you know, with John Boyega, with Adam Driver, with Daisy Ridley, with Kelly Marie Tran, but was an original story. Just think about how great that would be. Because at the end, I kind of think that, you know, while certainly the debate around this film is instructive, I also think that when you come down to it, The Last Jedi, it's not just that, you know, people were fighting over it. The real truth is that, for my money, it was never worth fighting over. Well, that wraps it up for today. I hope you've enjoyed this voyage. And before I sign off, I do want to say one more thing. I recognize that, you know, you can get a bit lost endlessly nitpicking these franchise films. So, I will pledge to you right now. I will try to do better in the future and, you know, do more commentaries about more worthwhile films that are more worthy of this kind of attention. Films that are worth fighting over. That's my pledge to you. And I will hold to it. Well, if you like this podcast, and come on, why the heck wouldn't you? Please click, click thumbs up, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, at THO Movie Reviews, and please check out all the great reviews and content we have at thomoviereviews.wordpress.com. Once again, I'm your host, Bennett Campbell Ferguson. I'm flying solo today, like Luke Skywalker in his X-Wing fighter. And from just me here at THO Movie Reviews, happy movie watching.